Dr. Nuremberg's mind-body workout system. Once again, I'd like to welcome you uh, to our seminar and uh, again reinstate my gratitude for your being here because you're the inspiration for me to do this. This is actually the highlight of every week, believe it or not, is this, this time that we get together uh, doing our class together. So uh, to whatever extent you need it, believe me when I say I need it more we're together and then I'm always surprised by everything that comes up myself so you're actually the source of the inspiration that brings out the knowledge that you you're here those of you watching on uh, the DVD those listening to the CD today uh, I'm going to talk about the law of the key factor a book that are called law of the key factor now I'm gonna keep you in a little bit of suspense as I go through the book and go through some epigrams uh, and then eventually I'll tell you what the key factor is. No system of management works without one key factor. No style of management can produce lasting positive effects without this factor. <coughs> Nothing's going to work unless people use this key factor. And it's been known throughout history, but it hasn't been focused on in management training until now. This key factor. It's out, out, this subtitle of the book, The Only Management Principle That Works. All other management principles are really not going to work unless this factor is in place. And once it's announced, there's absolutely nobody that disagrees that this is the key factor. And you wonder why it hasn't been articulated till this time. Now, when this key factor is missing, it leads to wars, poverty, disgruntled employees, litigation, misery in all forms, and the writing of this book. So this key factor, when it's not in place, leads to violence. It leads to mistrust. It leads to misery in every form. It leads to tremendous employee stress. We're going to focus mostly on the corporate structure, but we can also be talk, we'll talk a little bit about other organizations, such as the military. Absence of the key factor leads to exploitation. And the industry of, of management training, billions of dollars are spent on having instructors come, uh, independent contractors come, CDs, books, DVDs. But they're all useless without this key factor. With this key factor in place, then they can work. But without this, they cannot work. Because no matter what management method you're talking about, it's useless without this. This is a prerequisite for everything else to be effective. Now, it's, so when I say useless, it's not useless to attorneys, because the attorneys make a lot of money on litigation. And without this key factor, there's a lot of litigation. So what I'm going to go into, uh, I've tried to create a little curiosity about what is the key factor. To illustrate the name and reality key factor, a case history will first be presented. It's a case that shocked everyone in, in this company. Uh, John, who was a sales rep uh, in a photography company, he, he received 15% commission on all his sales. The photographer who took the photo photographs, he received 15% commission, and the telemarketer person, she got 5% commission. So it was all commission basis. One day, uh, a customer calls in and says John had been to her house but, and told her not to buy the photographs, that he can come on his own and do a better job and sell it at a better price. And she felt shocked because she really liked the photographs that our company had taken. And she didn't feel right that one of our own sales reps went there and tried to undermine this and then pocket the money himself. So in so, hearing that, uh, actually I was the person involved in this case, uh, when I had a photography business. And hearing the case, I thought, well, I thanked the person and I, I told our general manager to really check over his work for, for the future sales. And I didn't know if the customer was telling the truth. I didn't see why she'd be lying, but it was just one case, so I, I couldn't be sure. So as, we didn't let John know about the call. So we kept watching this for a period of time. And then we had two other people say that, yeah, we. We paid cash, so he'd written a receipt up for a certain amount, but they paid in cash and he, he pocketed the difference. He wrote the receipt up for a certain amount and pocketed the difference. Once we had a few cases like this, 
I called a meeting of all the photographers, all the, all the uh, telemarketers, all the sales reps, all the people whose livelihood was dependent on, on, on these sales. Now, this case I'm about to tell you illustrates a certain point, uh, I, but I don't recommend it uh, as literally to, to, for anybody to follow. So I called everybody in, and I said, you know, all of our incomes are interdependent on each other. Uh, and so that anybody who steals from the company is stealing from each of you. You, the photographer, you, the telemarketer. So everybody in the company was dependent on getting their commission. The sales reps getting their 15%, the photographers getting their 15%, the telemarketers. I said, each one of you, so if someone steals, they're not just stealing from the company, they're stealing from each of you. And I said, we had a case where we had somebody complain that if somebody was didn't offer to come back and shoot and, and reshoot the sale himself and, and give it a better price. And we checked on two other cases and we've got the evidence right here of, who this, of what this person did. To you, to all of you in the room, not just to me, the company. A lot of people think, well, rip off the company, they're rich, doesn't matter. Well, this is stealing from each of you. And the name of that person is John. And John was shocked that he's pointing him out. This is like public hanging. That's why I don't recommend it. It could be litigation from something like that. <laughs> so John was stammered. Everybody's jaw dropped. And he said, yeah, well, okay, I did it, but you know, you never listened to me when I was talking to you. We tried to give a little justification. And I said, you know, leave right this moment and I never return. So he left right then. He never did return. He even had some commissions due to him. He never came back even for those commissions. Now, again, I don't recommend this procedure because I, I guess he could end up suing me for, for doing this, possibly. I was told that later. But I did that for several reasons. I thought it would be good for the other sales reps because we suspect maybe other reps were doing this. And we want to set us an example. Hey, this could happen to you. You know, we're, we're checking on things. Because I'm a very trusting person. My management is very trusting, but we, so, but we now say, no, we're... We're checking things now. And we did find that uh, revenues went up. Now, a lot, now, here's what happened. People would come to me and say, I was shocked. That was horrible. But it was fair. You know, somebody come to me and say, you know, thank you. You protected all of us. And maybe other reps would do it. Maybe they won't do it either because there's a temptation to do this. So people would say, even though I don't like it, and even other sales reps say, I just, this is terrifying. I mean, you hung this guy in public. It was terrible. He was, it was a terrible situation. He said, but, but it wasn't unfair. It was fair. So there was a lot of talk. I don't think anybody, especially John, I don't think he'll ever forget it. And I'll never, I'll never forget it. And anybody present will never forget that. It was fair. And that brings me to the key factor, the law of fairness. Fairness has been the principle that's been missing. Fairness training has been missing in management training, whether it's about management of a corporation or management uh, of any organization. Could it be a governmental organization, could even be a military situation. The law of fairness is universally recognized. It is governed by a strict set of principles, whether acknowledged or unacknowledged. Fairness entails treating each person with dignity and respect. Assessments of the merits and accomplishments are made according to a uniform set of standards, regardless of race, religion, nationality, gender, age, etc. A good rule of thumb for fairness is to treat others the way you would want to be treated in the same circumstance. So my wife came up with another statement, which I then paraphrase when I present to you as Mahin's Law. Treat other people as you would have them treat your children, for everyone is someone's child. Treat other people as you would have them treat your children, for everyone is someone's child. So it's an extension of the, uh, the golden rule, except I think it's uh, even a higher amplification. Most of us are more upset when our children are treated wrongly than, than even if we're treated wrongly, so it, 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 it amps it up. Mm. And as we'll, as we'll see shortly, and, and as already demonstrated to some point, uh, the law of fairness is highly conducive to profitability. Highly conducive to profitability. As I said, my own company, revenues went up. Sales averages went up immediately. Apparently, uh, I'm sure other sales up was stealing. 
There's no question about it. I mean, he wasn't. It wasn't a lone case. So, it went up. so now fairness reduces the costs associated with turnover. If you're not fair with people, eventually they just get fed up and they look somewhere else. They become disgruntled. It reduces uh, costs associated with litigation, such as workers' compensation. A lot of people do get legitimately injured on the job, but if they, but some are not quite as injured as others, but someone has either fabricated an injury or it's a real injury, but they could have turned away from it. But they go after the company all with, 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 full, with full guns because they felt treated unfairly anyhow. Now, I've, I've known people who felt, gee, you know, the boss always treated me well. I'm not even going to file a worker's comp. And the person had a real injury. I don't know if people in that situation just wouldn't do it because they said, he always treated me well. And I'm, I'm not even going to go after the worker's comp. And of course, once you have a worker's comp claim, your worker's comp rates go up. So the overhead for the company goes up with higher premiums. And that can go up drastically. And there could be other uh, situations of uh, hostile work environment. If you treat people unfairly, they, they will sabotage the company. Uh, they will retaliate against the company. And these are, this, this boosts up the overhead quite a bit. Now, when people feel they're treated fairly, uh, they're more likely to follow policy, even if they don't like the policy. They say, this, this policy is stupid, but you know what? It's fair. I'm going to follow it. I don't like it. It's more work on my behalf. But no one really, once it's perceived as fair, no one really feels a, a, a major complaint against it. I might mumble a little bit and say, but that's ah, fair. I'm going to do it. Now, there's a variation of the law of fairness. It's, it must be, it, it's, I call it, it must be seen as not unfair. Sometimes it's hard to agree what's fair. So it's important for people to at least be able to say, well, that's not unfair. A lot of times you, people can say it's not unfair. See, people might have problems agreeing on what's fair, but everybody knows when something's unfair. Say, I don't, that's unfair. There's no doubt about it. Everybody says, that's unfair. So it's important that it be seen as not unfair. Now, people say honesty is the best policy, but actually honesty is but a ray of, of the sun of fairness. So it must be, every decision from the company, the organization, should be presented in a way that there's perception of fairness. First of all, management has to see it that way, that it's fair. Then it's more likely to be seen by the others as fair. We're not talking about hypnosis, we're talking about reality. If, it's, if in reality it's, it's fair, then it's more likely to be seen that way. It has to at least be seen as not unfair. So when a decision is announced, employees can tell themselves and clearly see that it is not unfair. It's not unfair. Now here's an example, uh, an, a, a sale contest in an organization. Whoever made the first 100 sales would get a bonus of $1,000. Sal and Joe both had the highest amounts and they, they were tied. They both they both, uh, uh, one did 5,000, one, one, uh, one did 500, which was most, and, and then the other did 5,000. But 500 and 5,000 were the two, uh, were the two highest. That's the total amount of sales. But they both did 100 sales. They did the same number of sales, but one did much higher than the other. So, but the, the contest for who could do the most sales, close the most accounts. Well, they both did, so there was a tie. So you would think one option was to give them both the thousand, uh, split the thousand dollar bonus, 500 for each, because both tied in the number of sales. But he gave it all to one of them and, not, and nothing to the other. And he said, and I'll tell you why. He said, one did $5,000 in business and one did 500. And that was not part of the requirement. We didn't, met, we didn't specify amount of money. But I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna bring that in because one, it was so much more, it led to so much more profit for the company. So even though they both tied a number of sales since one was so much higher. Now, if one would have done four, you know, 4,000 and one 5,000 in sales, it went closer, I would have split it. But since there's a huge, such a huge difference in the size of the sale, I'm gonna give it all to one. Now in some sense, i to say, well that wasn't what you announced. But, but it was such a huge difference in the total sales money-wise People didn't like it. The two people, the one who didn't get part of the bonus, many people didn't like it. But the perception was, well, it's not really unfair. It was so much a big difference in sales, even though that wasn't announced as part of the criterion. So it really, you can't say it's fair, but you can say, well, it's, it, doesn't seem, it doesn't seem unfair. 
and that was acceptable. So it, you didn't have employee uh, being disgruntled uh, after, after this reasoning was given. It was perceived as not unfair. Now, we all know the old cliche, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We all know that. As with most, as with most cliches, there's some truth to it. We have a, here's a case to illustrate the point. Chris was an office manager, head of uh, billing services from, for medical services. And he received a bill from Jones Chiropractics, and he left it on Jill's desk. Yeah, actually, Jill, that's the person mentioned here. And uh, left it on her desk, but she was out at work. No, he didn't put it on her desk. He meant to put it on her desk, but she was out of work. She didn't come in that day, so he had it on his <coughs> desk. Well, after a period of time, uh, Jones Chiropractic called and said, you know, we, 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 didn't get, we didn't get our billings, you know, we didn't get our fees from the billings that you're supposed to do for us. What, what happened? So the owner went to, to Chris, the manager, and he said, well, I, I, put on, I gave it to Jill. And Jill said, no, I never got it. So he personally went through uh, Chris's desk and he found it. And so what he did was, uh, when it came time for for uh, Chris's raise, uh, when that time came, he didn't give him the raise. But here's a spinoff of what happened. He had a lot of power. Chris had a lot of power over the billing clerks. And so he took it out on her. He said, you made me look bad. Uh, it, 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 you made me look very bad at what took place. And so if somebody was an, a half hour late, he wouldn't say anything. But, but if Jill was two minutes late, he'd write her up. He kept abusing that power. And eventually, she, she said, well, please don't do this. He tried to talk to him, but he kept taking this out on her that she made him look bad before the boss, before the owner. So she went to the owner and said, you know, he's penalizing me. Everything I do, he's on me. All the other clerks, nothing happens. He's retaliating on me. Well, the owner didn't do anything, and this went on for a period of time. What eventually happened, she left, went to all the accounts and said, I can do it for 30% less than what you're paying the owner there. And she took away half the accounts for herself and opened up her own business. The owner really felt the pinch from this, looked into it, even made her an offer to come back, but she was already set. And he had to lower his fees for the remaining people, lest he might lose it, he might lose those accounts as well. He had real regret that he hadn't done more when she brought the issue to him a number of times, and he, he fired Chris, the manager, who put him in this situation. So here, that kind of sabotage is not uncommon. When, when, when there's unfairness, it's going to cost. And when you're fair, it's going to lead to more profitability, less litigation, less theft, less sabotage, fewer workers' compensation cases, and so forth. So this is related to the abuse of power. So here again, the failure to apply the law, the law of fairness it often leads to abuse of power. If, if, if they don't find that, most people in power will abuse it unless they're really well indoctrinated in the in importance of fairness in management. <coughs> so in his case, by failing to apply the law of fairness, not only was there a tremendous breach of ethics, there was a tremendous loss of revenue as well. So we're looking at fairness uh, as creating a a more productive and harmonious work environment, and we're looking at reducing overhead tremendously. Cut down theft, turnover. There could be tremendous costs with turnover. You're not fair with people, eventually they'll look for some other job, they'll leave. And then depends how much your cost is associated with that. It could be very costly to recruit and train new people. Now, put at a broader level, what, what was the underlying factor in the communist revolution? Was, un, was the perception of unfairness. You had the super rich and, and, and making tremendous money, and then you had the poor peasants and the poor people working and not getting any kind of health benefits, working long, hard hours, and not really reaping any of the harvest. It was not a fair distribution of wealth given the amount of effort that was being put in. I mean, ultimately, communism has failed because of what human nature is. So I'm not advocating communism. I'm a hardcore capitalist myself. But we're looking at what the lack of fairness did. It actually led to the communist revolution, which led to tens of millions of people being slaughtered. Uh, it, it, had the law of fairness been more universally applied, millions of lives could have been saved. So we're looking at cost, 
both in terms of finances and we're looking at costs in terms of, of, of human life and suffering. Now, there's certain obstacles uh, to a manager or somebody in power being fair. Uh, one is health. If somebody's in poor health, they're tired, they're not feeling well, they're more likely to take it out on those who have less power than themselves. Insecurity, somebody might feel insecure in his or her job, afraid this one's trying to get his job, and so might really pick on that person because that person represents a threat. Instead of saying, gee, I'm glad you're so competent, I, I, you're helping make me money and everybody money, they say, no, you're a threat to me, you may get my job. So that's another obstacle. Appearances. You may have somebody who's very competent, but might be, let's say, very heavy or obese, or very not a good looking. That person would have less a chance to advancement than somebody who's more competent, or less competent, a lot less competent, but more attractive. Like Chris Rock says on his show, he says about women, he said, if you're not good looking, you better be real smart. <laughs> it's unfortunate, it's a, it's a sad truth, because that's not, it's not fair that somebody how, how much they weigh should be a factor, only the competence should have been. It's, it's an unfair, it's very unfair. So again, this is something that managers and people in power need to overcome in themselves, need to be alerted to and trained. Uh, past insults and complaints. Uh, if somebody feels, well, this employee ha has said something negative about them to the boss or somebody else, they remember that and they start picking on that person. Where somebody who's complimented said, gee, you look great, or you know, you're a wonderful person, turns his head from maybe negative things the person's doing, coming in late or not being as productive, more of turning his head, and then, but if the other person makes a mistake, jumping on it, well, that's not fair. Shouldn't be based on the fact that you felt offended, a person gave a little negative feedback. Then, of course, you have gender and racial preferences. Is that no place at all in the workforce for that? person produces, they should advance. They don't produce, they shouldn't advance as well. That has to be overcome in every manager. And if they have prejudices within themselves, they have to learn to recognize it and make sure it doesn't manifest in the workplace. It's better if they can overcome that kind of ignorance, but if they can't, at least make sure it doesn't show up in the workplace. And then certainly we talk about retaliation. <clears throat> Retaliating against an employee for something that we didn't like. Now, here's a case of somebody who hurt, worked in a warehouse and, and a crate fell on his leg and, and <coughs> damaged his leg. And after about four weeks, the supervisor called and said, well, when are you coming back? And he said, well, the doctor didn't release me yet. My leg is, is still in the cast. And the supervisor says, well, you're just milking the situation. You know, you should come in. You're milking the situation. You know, you, you come in here and, and earn, earn your keep. Well, after two of those calls, he went back in, even though he didn't have medical release, and went, went back to work against medical advice. And when he, when he got back, there was retaliation. The supervisor would give him all the, all the hard jobs, which is especially hard giving his medical condition, would take it out on him. So he started documenting this and worked up a case of retaliation and hostile work environment. So the, and, and eventually there was a lawsuit. It was, it was all documented, and it literally cost the company millions of dollars in the lawsuit because it was well documented, it was done in front of witnesses uh, in, from this retaliation hostile work environment. So here, again, the failure to apply the law of management was very costly to the company. It was not only unethical and immoral and wrong, it was financially highly detrimental. So in that case, again, workers' compensation goes up. Those premiums become absorbent. Sometimes industries have to practically close down or they have to send the work out of this country to find places where they don't have workers' compensation. The question is, given how obvious it is, how tremendously obvious it is about fairness, what, what, how come it hasn't been talked about, focused on? And the answer is priorities. Most people in management, because they haven't been trained in fairness management, their priority isn't necessarily the well-being of the organization. They're very often interested in their own personal power. So we have people just on what's called an ego trip, just in their power, they're not focused on the priority of fairness. So in terms of any kind of training, people have to be tuned into, you know, you, these are some of the corrupting factors towards fairness, and we want to train you about this, we want to alert you to this uh, for your sake and the sake of the company. 
Now, there's a tremendous uh, intrapersonal spinoff of this. See, if a person is not fair, if they're unfair in the business or in any aspect of their life, what happens? There's an immediate justice that's built into the psyche itself. Most people don't know this. Justice is built into the psyche, and it goes like this. It works through the mechanism of projection. If a person's unfair, what do they project onto the world? It's an unfair world. They're corrupted, they're unfair, they project on the world, it's unfair. So what's the immediate punishment for being unfair? They can't feel secure in the world, and they can't trust anyone, because they themselves are unfair, so they project that onto others. They don't expect to get a fair treatment themselves because they've been unfair. Conversely, somebody who's been fair tends to see the world as a safer place. They have more uh, peace of mind, not as stressed as the other person, and they feel more ability to trust others. It's a terrible thing not to be able to trust. So when a person's unfair, they project the unfairness on others, they don't trust. That failure to trust leads to isolation and loneliness, a crushing loneliness. So is there a consequence to being unfair? Financially, I've demonstrated that. What's not known is that personally, the cost is enormous, causing loneliness, mistrust, paranoia. Now, so we, we talked then for the financial payoff of fairness, applying the law of fairness, is less turnover, fewer workers' comp cases, reduced absenteeism, reduced litigation, enhanced morale, and reduces theft. So this is, in terms of the practicality, uh, there's some corollaries we need to look at. One corollary is the lesser of two evils. And I'm going to give you an example of it. And then we're going to go into how, how do you arrive at just considerations. Let's say there's a battle ongoing. We're talking about the organization now of, of, of the army. And a general <coughs> decides to send 20 men into certain death to divert the enemy. And he's doing this to save 20,000 troops because if the troops, because if the enemy knows about what's going on on one of the flanks, then it could cost the lives of 20,000 men. So he sends 20 men to their death to save 20,000 lives and, and ensure the success of the mission. Now a person can say it's unfair to send these 20 guys. It's not right. But it's also not right for them to let the 20,000 die. So, there is a justice in it, and, and, and the corollary is the lesser of two evils. Both are wrong. Often in life, it's not a choice between right and wrong. It's often a choice between two wrong alternatives. I call it the morality of the gray area. It was less wrong to let the 20 men die than to let the 20,000 die and to ensure the success of the mission. So in looking at that, you can't say it's fair, but you can't say it's unfair. That's just, again, that correlative of saying it's not unfair. It can be perceived as not unfair. Now, determining fairness is often very tricky, truly, to know what's just, and I'm going to demonstrate that point to you. Let's say he chose the 20 men, and guys he didn't like personally, and he sent them out. Well, you think a little less of the guy then, right? A little less of the general. It will still save the 20,000 lives, but it makes it less fair, right? But now, okay, so now it went from thinking, well, he's a totally just man to, well, you know, took care of 20 guys that he hated. Now, if you found out, he, he said, now if you found out, he said, gee, each of these are somebody's child, some parents are going to be mourn their child, I'll send my son in with them. He picks 20 people, not based on who he hates, but he puts his son as one of them. That's his own son die. Then you say, wow, this is, this is a great human being, right? He's letting his own son die along with the other men, and he's going to mourn that because he, he feels he's going to do this to the other parents, he wants to be amongst them. He has that feeling. So you, feel, so you think more highly of the person, right? Well, then when you get more information, you find out he hates his wife and he wants to punish her by getting the kid killed. <laughs> and you find out, he said, well, this guy's a jerk. So you see, we flip-flop. <coughs> As you get more information, it was still, militarily speaking, a right decision, but your evaluation of him, what kind of a man he is, whether he's a just man or not, flip-flop, right? back and forth with more information. Now that leads us to then, uh, how do we ascertain fairness, the universal principles of fairness? In making a decision, 
The first step is to ascertain the facts. So what, what are the true facts here? That has to be ascertained. It has to be fact gathering. And you have to then always consider, in doing that, consider the context. On one hand, if all you knew was he sent 20 men definitely to their death, you say, this is a terrible general. Well, while he did that to save 20,000, it changes it. The context is everything. Often, especially important decisions, when possible, sometimes in a military situation is not as possible, but an emergency situation is not as possible. But consulting with others is often one way to get a balanced view, to get other opinions. And it's especially good when you can get consensus. There's a division of ideas, and a mixed vote, well, maybe it's not totally the right course. And so you have to independently investigate and make the decision. Now, in terms of the organization, let's go back to the organizational issues. How would we train managers to be fair? Well, one is, in Dr. Nimmer's mind-body workout system, they would need a, one, a, a couple of power thoughts. One power thought is, fairness is my first priority. Fairness is my first priority. Fairness is my first priority. And then, of course, focusing, closing the eyes. Fairness is my first priority. And then the movement to proprioceptive involvement. Fairness is my first priority. 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 So an important part and then, uh, of, of fairness training for the management is they have to be repeating certain power thoughts the first day every five minutes and then twice an hour thereafter. Because otherwise we can be governed by other irrational factors within ourselves that would be detrimental to ourselves and to the organization that we're involved with. Now, also the other part is to be truly fair uh, and to overcome many of our personal limitations, a person has to have a loyalty and a commitment to the organization, whether it's the United States Army, whether it's a particular private corporation, has to say the organizational needs are extremely important. Now, whenever you make this commitment to the organization, the whole thing in fairness is first part is looking for the needs of the organization, but the second part is not violating the rights of the individual. So you don't want to violate the rights of the individual and yet you want to really have the first priority, the, the, the needs of the organization. So the, the other, other power thought would be the needs of the organization are paramount. The needs of the organization come before my needs. The needs of the organization come before my needs. The needs of the organization come before my needs. The needs of the organization come before my needs. The needs of the organization come before my needs. When you meet those rare people, you know them fast. They, you can see they're not coming from the point of view of gaining personal power, they're not a power trip. They're really, when you meet them, and it's not too often, you can see they're really representing the needs. You can take them aside, try to do this, that. The needs of the organization are their priority. So they're being really fair to the organization. And you know, a lot of times when they have that priority, uh, you can feel it, and you don't take the decision back. Because you say, he's not getting any more money out of this decision. He's not power tripping on me. He's protecting the organization. Very few people can take it personally then, because he can say, it's nothing personal. He's not saying this to me because of my race, my gender, my looks, anything else. He's doing it to protect the, the organization. So he's going to respect the decision. He may not like it, but I have to respect the person. He's protecting the needs of the organization. Nothing personal. That's the, that's the important thing, nothing personal. So at least there are two power thoughts in terms of the, the, uh, justice, fairness being a priority, and the need, putting the needs of the organization first. But then, of course, in any organization that has its rules and, 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 and procedures, there has to always be, and this goes along with the, the lesser of two evil corollary, there has to always be a way around those rules. For example, let's say there's an organization, say a governmental organization, and this person is, is six months away from retiring, but he or she does something wrong on the job, makes a mistake, costs the, cost the, cost money to the, to the organization, costs the company 10, 20,000. An honest mistake was a major mistake and could get terminated over it. Forgot to, fo didn't follow the right procedures, made some wrong decisions, could have been terminated. So the supervisor, uh, says she's a month away, there was 30 years of service. It's not right this person loses all retirement benefits for this mistake, even though it was a costly mistake. So the supervisor puts, puts her on, this is based on a true story, by the way, puts her on personal leave, grants her personal leave 
to have time off. So while the term is off, the clock is ticking until the month is over, the person is granted full retirement benefits and then everything's dropped. Now a person can say, well, what you did was wrong. You violated procedure. You could say that. But on the other hand, and so it's wrong to go against the procedure. A person should have been, by the rules, prosecuted and terminated right then. But that was a more, so it's a lesser of two evils. It was less of wrong to keep that person after 30 years and let them squeak by another month and then the thing just went away. So the supervisor didn't do something to benefit him. He did it to benefit that person being fair to that person. And that person, by the way, uh, his reputation was very widespread as a fair person. I went to his retirement, and I mean, people, <laughs> everybody knew you can count on him for fairness and to be in your corner if you didn't violate certain basic core principles. All right, now, so we talked about uh, the universal principles. We talked about intrapersonal, that, that the extent that we're, we're fair with others, we become more secure, less stressed in the world ourselves. And it develops within us a sense of self-control. We get more self-control, which leads to uh, a very enhanced self-concept. And Michael and I were talking about that, and he was bringing up these points. And it also leads to more of a sense of nobility. A person feels like they, they, a person, no, they, a person carries himself differently. A person who is governed by fairness carries himself very differently. You see it, it just emanates. And their self-concept is, you know, they're going to seek what's fair, what's just, and that's their self-control and their nobility. It just leads to a, a whole different uh, demeanor. Now, so we're talking about intrapersonal. So that's being ultimately good to yourself. To be fair is really, in the long run, good for ourselves, good for the organization. Then you have interpersonal fairness. Uh, and again, the same, pers the same power thought. Being fair is my first priority. Being fair is my first priority. We do not seek uh, personal advantage over the other person. A lot of people, they negotiate. Each is negotiating for what's best for them. And it's they say, well, look, I want to do what's best for us both. Because in any negotiation, if you have somebody that's on the short end of that, it's not going to work. That person will undermine it. Ha both have to be happy with it. If you have one person unhappy with the negotiation, they will destroy it somewhere along the line. It won't last. So the best thing is, are you satisfied with your end? Well, it's two things. Both parties can say they're satisfied. The next best is say, well, I can live with it. There's a lot to be said for that. Well, I can live with it. Well, if you get either I'm satisfied or I can live with it, then you have a real deal. If somebody feels, well, you're taking advantage of me, you overpowered me, you're just smarter than me, you're, you spoke faster, I, I, I was too impulsive, I shouldn't have agreed. You get something like that going on, it will be undermined. It's, it's not going to last. It will not, it, it will not prosper in the long run. So there again, we have to be concerned that the other person's really satisfied in doing this uh, interpersonally. So we've discussed the, the law of fairness from <coughs> intrapersonal, interpersonal, organizational fairness. Now let's look at some of the uh, more philosophical, existential aspects of fairness. What is the most cherished virtue in a great leader? It is none other than fairness. Only through justice can true security be achieved. Injustice breeds vengeance. A person feels treated unfairly, that's what sets up, well, I want to get you back. That's what sets up the whole vengeance motivation. To transcend ourselves is the first step in the quest to be fair. When a per in unfairness, injustice can breed disaster. On a more mystical note, no intellect can fully comprehend the infinite the infinite scope of justice. For it is enshrined in every atom and every aspect of existence. For nature favors no man. If you drop a five pound weight on any human being, doesn't matter what race, religion, gender, nationality, it has the exact same effect. Exactly. No difference. The sun shines, everybody standing out of the shadows, it shines on us all alike. No preference. You don't get the sunshine and you don't there's no tree blocking, whatever. You're standing next to me. You get the sun. I get the sun. It's totally impartial. It's true impartial justice. It's built in to everything, into the cells of the body. If the body 
doesn't have enough water, dehydrates, it leads to a weakened system, could even lead to death, doesn't matter who it is. Injustice is at the root of every war. Without justice, there can be no progress, for justice is the foundation of an ever-advancing civilization. Injustice breeds insanity, and insanity breeds injustice. Injustice is the ultimate context of insecurity. The true voice of justice is rationality. Injustice divides, justice unites. The true seeker prostrates to the holy shrine of justice. Justice is the highest form of universal love. Justice is the supreme ordering principle of a true civilization. Chaos is the absence of justice. Okay, I'm gonna open it to questions, comments. Uh, Come on. Yeah. They, they, I think it's a brilliant analysis. I've been in business for 40 years myself, and I think it's a, the most important principle. I was just wondering if um, sometime, you know, like you take consumer surveys, if uh, you mentioned the Russian Revolution, uh, maybe the leader should try to find out if the employees or feel that he is a fair, fair leader, that he feels that he's passing uh, fairness, whether it should, uh, something should be done. So it could be where employees are invited, whether you're evaluating the situation the, the or whether you should also, if you have a difficult situation with an employee, whether you should ask them whether you think you're dealing with, whether they feel that you're dealing with them fairly or not. The, the, the point's being made that there should be an ongoing evaluations of people in power, management. Well, I'm just asking your opinion. Yeah, and the opinion is being asked about whether there should be ongoing evaluations of people in power where they get feedback whether they're being fair, and their superiors are getting that feedback. Uh, I think it could be threatening to the person, uh, but I think a person would, uh, but I think it would lead to a lot of uh, advancement, and it would, it would stop a lot of the violations, and uh, ultimately would lead to, to good. Uh, there should be, I know in schools now, when I was a student, they didn't have this, but they do now, where a lot of times the students evaluate the professor, they get, a, they get some evaluation. I will say this, you know, I mean, people might be afraid to say uh, he's going to retaliate against me, so any evaluation has to be anonymous. If you're, gonna, if you're going to give a rating to your supervisor and your management, it's got to be anonymous. It's got to be where you just can't possibly figure it out either because the person fears retaliation. But certainly exit interviews when somebody's leaving a company for whatever reason, ask, well, is there any injustice going on in this company? Is that part of the reason you're leaving? No, no, I got a better offer here, whatever. Or yeah, so-and-so just keeps picking on me. You know, and I, and I went to Superior, nothing's being done. So certainly exit interviews, it could be done without the fear of retaliation because they're not part of that organization anymore. So I think it's a very good idea to at least, and I, it's a very good idea to ask people, oh, are, you, are you being treated fairly, are you being treated unfairly, or to rate it from one to five, five, six, very fair, uh, uh, zero is totally lack of fair, fairness. But that's why we have unions. Yeah. Now the unions, the coins, that's why we have unions to help deal with the injustice. And it is true, as much of, as an entrepreneur as that I am and a capitalist that I am, uh, certainly people were being violated, the human rights were much more violated before unions, even though unions have certainly introduced a great deal of their own issues and their own problems that have gone on. But that's why unions were created. That's why a lot of things have happened. I mean, like I say, revolutions have happened. All the revolutions go in South America say, well, not just what happened in the Cuban Revolution, the got Castro in there, well, Batista, he's unjust, he's, you know, the poor people aren't eating, the rich are doing well. We have that tremendous divide with, you have a multi-billionaire over here and across the street's a guy who can't eat. There's a lack of fairness in that. I mean, he should at least be able to survive, find some way in that society to survive, and, and that will lead to revolution. Uh, in, a, in an organization, in a corporation, it will lead to people subverting the company or opening competition or stealing the clients, whatever. Yeah, Peter. Um, I'm old enough to remember uh, in my growing up phase that fairness was was 
considered part of the American way. It was like mm -hmm. taught in sports, and uh, it was almost it was almost part of the American creed okay. in movies and and the way you choose things on who's gonna uh, in baseball where you're going you know hand right. up, hand up the bat and. Uh, the point is being made that back in the day, uh, we're talking about about 40 years ago, yeah. 50 years ago, uh, justice and fairness was more of the norm. That was what was expected. Many a deal you hear was not on a handshake. And that's true. But look how much discrimination. Who was fair with whom? Look at what we call minority groups. I mean, certainly, uh, I don't want to go too much into that, but uh, how, how far did that go? How far did it go gender-wise or race-wise? That's a whole other issue. Certainly there are more rights universally than there ever were, and yet we're still, I wouldn't call us a totally just society, although this, the, the, the American spirit is noble and great, tremendously noble. Is there corruption and decadence within it as people? Yeah, sure, that, that goes on too. But uh, so although you hear about a handshake did it and we were honorable people, that is true. But it wasn't universal for all Americans, regardless of race or religion or gender. So I think we've made progress in that sphere. But at the other hand, uh, uh, a, sh a handshake amongst practically it doesn't suffice now amongst almost anybody, no matter what race, religion, or gender they are. Everyone's want to write it down, get it. So we have lost something. We've gained a lot, and we've lost a lot. Yeah. So that idea of the American dream kind of like spawned the idea of fairness and we were able to apply it to like mass media type of things, you know, to promote it throughout the world. But then the human flaws of like discrimination, harassment, selfishness, you can't have those in order for that idea to actually apply itself socially. The point's being made that the ideas of uh, capitalism, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, freedom, Freedom has with it, as we all know, tremendous responsibility. And because of our own foibles, we need to be protected against that. Either we have to protect others against our own limitations or, or somebody's going to do it for us. So, the power thought, fairness is my first priority. The needs of the organization come before my own needs. There are at least two power thoughts that all management, everybody in power, needs to apply. Same in parenting. Uh, fairness. You know, one kid gets nothing, maybe uh, this is an actual example where his bicycle is taken, give it to the favorite son. Or you, you did this for, for him, but you didn't do it for me. So a father or a parent has to say, fairness is my first party, because the kids will know, hey, you're, you're doing something for him, you didn't do it for me. And it leads to tremendous sibling rivalry where the, the siblings get to take it on each other. You, you get this, this, they just remember, it's, it's a statement's made, that they just remember the unfairness that went on. So. The unfairness, uh, here's leaders, when I talk about all organizations, whether it's military, governmental, and any form, uh, private corporations, private, private companies, and the family. Being fair, my first priority, and the needs of the organization come before my own. The needs of the family come before my own. I may want to just take off and go here for a holiday, but you know, we have four kids and there's no pla and it's not a place for kids to be, so I have to give up my needs so that the needs of the family are being considered. Every mother, every father understands that point. But it certainly be good for all leaders. And every parent is a leader. Every parent is a leader. Every parent, every manager, every, anybody in power in the government, corporations, military, should have fairness is my first priority. The needs of the organization come before my own needs. In fact, I'm going to adopt it myself. I, I haven't used those two. I can use it myself, although it's there. I recently started using the fairness as my first priority. I recently started doing that one. But the second one, the needs of the organization come before my own needs, I want to apply to myself as well. So we're looking at management. Everything can be perceived as management, whether you're talking about parenting or being a general, a colonel, a sergeant, a, a general manager, a supervisor, at, at any level. Anybody who has power over another human being. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> when you talked about fairness as a law, I'm thinking that there's a retribution, and I guess that you, I guess you did kind of make it clear that fairness breeds um, high morale, productivity, where an unfairness would breed uh, low morale, uh, counterproductivity. I find that when I hear about fairness is my first priority, I'm putting the needs of the organization first. That could be a conflict. 
It can be because, again, we talked about putting the, the, giving a priority to the needs of the organization but, but not violating the rights of the individual. That's got to be balanced with that. Putting the needs of the organization before my needs. So we didn't say the, the needs of the organization are my first priority. We said I put the needs of the organization before my needs. Fairness is my first priority. I'm putting the needs of the organization before my needs. Uh, that's, that's the important thing, so we don't get caught up in our own personal preferences, uh, so prejudices. Yeah. And I, I like the fact that another thing that came out of the lecture close to the end was that you said uh, injustice breeds insanity, and insanity breeds injustice, which lets us know that there are some insanities associated with the unfairness. Because one of the things that I thought about that uh, can be when unfairness is present is that there could be some insanity of um, self-entitlement. I deserve this because, or and so superiority. And I think those are some of the things. That Very interesting. Work. Points being made, if a person is being treated unfairly, the, the person might then develop a sense of I'm entitled because I was treated so unfairly uh, because I was... Uh, the run to the litter, I was not the favorite child because of a particular race or gender or whatever, well, the other or way religion. That I deserve this because I am superior yeah. and but, unfair to you, you know. So we look at the person who was deprived because of whatever the factor is. They feel, well, you know, something's owed to me, uh, and, it might, and it might even, and, and that could be a legitimate claim. Uh, on the other hand, it could be also too much of a claim, but each case would have to be uh, ascertained uh, in and of itself. Uh, whether what the entitlement is, um, but that's a valid point. It leads to a sense of entitlement, and also the the flip side is being made. Also, that the one who is favored walks around just feeling, well, I'm great, I'm superior, therefore I'm entitled to whatever I want because you don't matter compared to me. That could have been established uh, through uh, how you know that you were treated better than your other siblings. It could be because you were treated better than other races or other religions or other nationalities. You can get that sense of entitlement. And when you see somebody with that, it's, you can tell. You say, this, guy, this guy feels better than me. You just feel it. It's at least something really nasty. You can, you can tell when someone's carrying that attitude. It's the opposite of humility. Humility is a very attractive feature. A person can be an authority and still be in power and command with humility, but when you, when you see this, it's, it's with arrogance. Yes? Yeah, you mentioned you measure success of fairness by the, the increase in productivity or the reduction in cost of... <coughs> well, you know, the point is being asked about how do you measure fairness. It's not measured by costs or productivity. We're saying that fairness will lead to a more harmonious environment where people are more productive and, and, and the lack of fairness will lead to sabotage and lawsuits and turnover and, and more cost to the company. It will decrease, unfairness will ultimately, in the long run, reduce the bottom line. Fairness in the long run will increase the bottom line. But the, uh, the only measure of fairness has to be case by case when you're fair in this situation, when you're fair in that, and it has to be evaluated. Of course, you have to, have to ascertain the facts. For instance, that general looked like he was being fair, then it looked like more facts came in, he was not that fair, another fact came in, he was fair. You could flip-flop based on how much knowledge you have. We're here, we're talking a lot about the companies, but we could also apply this to our everyday living fairness in our own personal life, which will help dramatically in every way there is, while working or not working. Make life a lot easier. Well, the point is being made that certainly the fairness goes into our everyday life, both as parents, uh, or a person may feel this way. Here's a person, uh, it could be, uh, fairness also can affect our judgmentalness. You know, a person sees, let's say, a drunk lying in the street, begging for money, uh, l laying in his own vomit and urine, and you go, yuck, what a, what a loser, what a what a demented person doing this and bad judgment coming. Well, that's not a necessarily a fair judgment. If you had the facts, you may find out that's the greatest holy man on this earth because what if it turned out that he was molested and tortured and beaten every day growing up and he's staying drunk just to prevent himself from killing people. So he's to protect others, he's keeping himself inebriated. He's had noble enough to destroy himself to protect others against himself. So fairness would be we cannot judge another without knowing the context. You can't do it. So to do that is unfair. So in terms of everyday activities, yes, being judgmental without the facts is unfair. 
and very rarely do we have the facts. So when you see somebody in that situation, you don't know. That could have been his situation. So you can treat him as a loser or you can treat him as a great holy man that maybe is protecting others. from others. It's your choice how you want to look at this person, but looking, judging him badly is not good for you. You know, a lot of times when people make judgments like that, they end up in those situations. They've looked down on people who did X, Y, and Z, and before you know it, they're in a the position of X, Y, and Z. I've seen it happen many times. I, I think the act of fairness is like a, and every individual's means to keep like the universe or the world in balance. So sometimes you have to be unfair to keep your world or your universe in balance, just like you were saying about that general. You know, sometimes you have to do an unfair thing. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, fairness could look like unfairness, like in the situation of the general. That's the case being made. We need to bring our, our seminar to a conclusion. And uh, again, I'm grateful that each one of you are here, very grateful, because you're the source of my inspiration to present this. So I'm thanking you very much. I'm grateful to you. Awesome.